Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Wherever you are watching this in the world, we're welcoming you to hear about the geopolitics of technology. We've got a great panel coming up. And the reason we're talking about this topic is that as the European Union considers its new digital regulatory agenda, the new US administration is taking a tougher line on China and on tech companies. And we need to talk more about how do we deal with the divides that exist and may in fact even be growing in transatlantic digital policy. In essence, what are the forums we need to overcome those differences? And how do we weigh the challenge from China and the threat that it poses to Western democracy versus our own preferred models and how we stick to those value systems? So joining me now, we have four fantastic guests. Three of them are with us and the fourth will be joining soon. So I'd like to welcome to you uh, Carl Bildt, who's the former Prime Minister of Sweden and currently serving as a World Health Organization Special Envoy for access to COVID-19 vaccines and other tools. We've got Annette Kroberiel. She's the Vice President for Government Affairs and Public Policy in Europe for Google, obviously one of the world's biggest technology companies, one of the biggest companies overall. And we have Alina Polyakova, who's President and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis, based in Washington, DC. And then joining us soon, hopefully, is Eva Kali, who is a member of the European Parliament and belongs to the Socialist and Democrats group. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. We don't have much time, so let's just dive right into it. Um, I might turn to you first, Carl, if I may. You come from a country that has certainly been subject to authoritarian bullying from China. It's still ongoing, if I understand it correctly. And you've also been at that front line of how you come to compromises and decisions between governments in the EU, dealing with superpowers around the world as well. So give us your feedback on where the limits are today. China is actively exporting its uh, authoritarian models. What do we as countries in the West need to do to respond to that uh, through technology? Well, I'm. I'm not among those who believe that they are very active exporting their model. I, I've been around long enough to remember when they actually did that. Uh, but that was a couple of decades ago. But what they are doing is to exporting sort of the success of what they perceive, what they perceive to be the success of their economic model. And by that, of course, they are exerting also a certain amount of political influence, no doubt. I mean, take a fact that sort of last year was uh, China past the United States as being the biggest trading partner of the European Union, or we'll take the fact that uh, half of the countries of the world are trading twice as much with China as they are trading with the United States. I mean, these things are translated into political influence. But what is primarily concerning us here is, of course, the fact that there's a race for control of the technologies of the future. Much as the industrial age was shaped by those countries, that control the technologies, the digital age will be shaped by those that control the technologies. And here it's been the United States who's been ahead, uh, no question, still is in, ahead in terms of innovations. But the Chinese have been catching up very, very fast, in primarily, perhaps not as much innovation as in application. Um, and uh, if we are not alert to that and, and, and counter it, primarily by being better ourselves, uh, then that will have significant political ramification for the geopolitics of the world uh, in the decades ahead. Absolutely. And of course, there are Swedish companies right on the front line there in terms of, I'm thinking of the dispute around 5G, for example, Ericsson and Huawei. Uh, Annette, if I could turn to you, uh, we've seen in recent years the EU push for a uh, new policy perspective, let's say, uh, which they call strategic autonomy. But one of the things that is most interesting and unique about uh, the digital policy space is that it's always been a multi-stakeholder space. There's a lot of interdependence uh, and there's a much bigger role for private companies and civil society than there is in a lot of other policy making space. So I wanted to get your views on how realistic it is for the EU to even aim for this vision of strategic autonomy. Uh, and if you've got a different viewpoint, where do you think they should be headed? Uh, thanks, Ryan, and thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> so indeed, we have seen in the past years uh, very uh, strong calls for digital sovereignty, for digital, uh, for 
uh, strategic autonomy, a very strong protectionist language. And we would love to see this pivoting to a notion of, as you just mentioned, a strategic interdependence, uh, because obviously um, the US and Europe are, uh, need to have a close cooperation based on uh, joint values. Uh, to get to a future-proof uh, tech regulation. And let me give you three examples. Uh, one is a Corona sustainability and then um, hate speech. Uh, you have seen during the last year in particular that uh, the internet is a very important tool to um, keep um, the businesses um, in business, to keep the lights on, uh, to uh, keep uh, people safe and healthy to uh, keep them sane through entertainment uh, and then also to uh, enable obviously companies to um, let their employees work from home to let them stay connected and that has worked pretty well um, sustainability is obviously a huge topic uh, climate change is one of the biggest challenges that we need to tackle in the next year that we need to tackle as humanity and uh, here again, internet, the internet technology can play a huge role. Let me give you just one tiny trivial example, but I think Google Maps gives you a great opportunity to, um, to travel or to plan for more sustainable travel for a more energy saving journey. So uh, that's obviously a tiny example of out of many, many opportunities um, technology gives you to um, save energy and uh, play a role in on, on the sustainability topic. And then tonight uh, we are celebrating the second anniversary of the Christchurch call. Uh, world leader, leaders will come together to address, to discuss how we can actually work together to address hate speech uh, and how to progress um, uh, fighting this, this phenomenon that is really, uh, it's a, a, a very important. And here again, you can see we can only progress advance if we work uh, together uh, more closely. So from our perspective, it's really time to uh, for closer cooperation based on shared values, a shared understanding of the Internet's potential for science, for progress, for innovation. Um, well, if we um, um, the more we collaborate, actually, the more we can uh, use the potential of the Internet. And yes, you, you look at me and I'm leading the government affairs team of Google in Europe. So I should also say it's absolutely crucial that we work together on getting tech regulation right. And I think we will discuss a bit uh, more uh, later on. But I think that's 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 my perspective here. Yeah, that's great. Um, now, Alina. You've been worried for quite some time about this transatlantic policy divide. We've seen it really grow on issues like privacy. There are different approaches to antitrust and competition policy and so on. Um, I was wondering, tell us a little bit how worried you are about that growing divide and where do you think that this sits historically? You know, we have seen that the EU and the US can cooperate. They've done it for decades, even though they have other policy differences. So there's ways to bridge these divides, uh, even when we exist on separate tracks. Um, so, so tell us how that compares compared to other times when it's been really tough, whether that is on trade, whether that is on arms control, et cetera. Well, thanks so much, Ryan, and uh, really delighted to be here and to be co-hosting this with Delphi. Um, and I just maybe will say a couple of words to put together what I think Aneta and Carl have already said, which is the reality is that digital issues and tech innovation in particular has to be that third element that undergirds the transatlantic alliance. The first two, of course, being common and collective defense and security. The second being our common democratic values and principles. And we have not really focused on uh, the reality that the world is becoming far, far more digital, digitalized at a pace that none of us anticipated. And we've certainly seen that even more amplified and magnified during the COVID-19 pandemic. Yet we haven't developed the same kinds of mechanisms on cooperation. We have NATO for collective security and defense, obviously that was prompted uh, by the end of the Second World War, an atrocity 
and a terrible event for the United States and Europe and the entire globe. Uh, we have great cooperation and common values around democracy, uh, open societies, uh, the idea of personal, individual, and human rights. Uh, much of that really came together with the fall of the, of the Soviet Union and the third wave of democratization that took over the world, where many former East Bloc countries became democratic uh, countries and part of your Atlantic institutions. But now we really have to work on that third piece, which is how do we move away from building barriers to cooperation on tech innovation, research and development, and policy so that we can be better than our competitors that are increasingly pushing forward a digital authoritarian model. And that is actually growing in appeal across the world as well. So Carl mentioned China, of course, and China is a long-term threat and challenge. And it's true that the only way we'll be able to outcompete, innovate uh, Beijing's growing efforts in the tech space is by being leaders ourselves. And just last thing I'll say, I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit more uh, as part of the discussion, but of course the EU wants to be the global leader on regulation and tech policy, but you have to be a global leader on innovation as well. If you want to regulate an industry that you don't lead on, that can present a real challenge. And that's really here where the United States has to be at the table as Brussels is thinking about its next steps and its ambitions to be a global leader in tech innovation. Mm -hmm. Well, let's maybe switch now to talking about the forums. Oh, no, sorry. We have Ava uh, who's, who's joined us. Welcome, Ava. Um, I already gave you the introduction about the great role that you're playing at the European Parliament. So I should give you a chance to make um, some first opening comments. Uh, I know that you have been really focusing in particular on artificial intelligence recently. And we've just been talking about uh, a growing policy divide on both sides, of, between the two sides of the Atlantic. And I think that's really come into focus on artificial intelligence in recent weeks, where the EU has uh, published what it would like to see as some new norms in the space. And then we saw the US government advisor on AI, Eric Schmidt, the former CEO at Google, he came out very bluntly earlier this week at the Copenhagen Democracy Summit and just said the EU is approaching this the wrong way. Um, so I'd love to, to get you to tell us a little bit about those EU norms um, and maybe make the case for why Eric Schmidt has got it wrong. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm sorry I had some issues to, to connect. So um, actually, I think that after the new the elections of the new um, uh, President of the United States, uh, we've seen a switch, a shift to the um, direction towards uh, tech regulation of US. I think uh, we have an opportunity to collaborate. I, um, I recall that Ursula von der Leyen, the president, has uh, talked about an accord on artificial intelligence with the US should um, take place at least to start a dialogue. And I have the, um, I believe that uh, this uh, this technology, artificial intelligence, is cannot be controlled by by borders, and its full potential uh, we we can benefit from will be when we manage to have common standards to be able to exchange best practices and to benefit uh, at uh, the most our citizens. So I, I don't think we have a way to not agree. Uh, maybe the discussion now that takes place needs to. Um, um, let's say we, we need to put some uh, some water in our wine, but uh, uh, in the same time, um, I believe that Europe has more strong beliefs on how to balance privacy with safety and not to allow the tech companies to lead how uh, the internet should be regulated. So the end of this year, we'll find maybe a stronger regulatory framework um, that will be discussed and hopefully will be balanced enough and we, we are aiming to achieve something similar to the GDPR to be able to become, this is the ambition, huh? to become the, the uh, global standard setters for the internet. And, um, I, I, and, and it depends, as I said, to the administration of, uh, of US, if this would be something that we can agree. I, I have the feeling that recently we saw what happened with facial recognition. And we don't have so many differences. Um, I, I would say that in some um, some states of the U.S., 
we saw that they are very strong into banning this technology completely. While in Europe, we are more tech neutral. We try to follow what the technology will do. Try to have um, an approach of the, you know, the, the uh, risk approach. Um, so if it's risky, the way you're going to use the technology to have to follow more responsibilities and more safeguards. So I believe in the end, the vision is to have technologies that will be complementary and uh, beneficial to people. I don't see how we cannot agree in, uh, um, in this line. Um, so low risk AI will not have more restrictions. And this means we can definitely even there find room to, to collaborate. So let's see, because I have this feeling that US will enter a new era of regulation. And maybe it's too soon to see that uh, Eric Smith will be the one who will show us the direction of uh, the new US policy. Well, maybe let's now turn to those forums for where we could all be getting on the same page. Uh, and I, I think maybe we'll have different ideas about what those forums should be. But I guess the context remark to make as we go into to that part of the discussion is that we've always seen global spaces for discussion around the internet. It's a, it's a, a unified internet rather than a balkanized internet, let's say. There have been some risks to that in the past. I think some uh, authoritarian governments would prefer to wall off their internet and not have it as that free flow of information. Um, so I guess it brings a, a, a kind of philosophical question to the table of do democracies need to club together in order to be more organized and effectively set those norms and control that unified space by being the most organized? Um, or uh, do we continue down the existing path where we try and always have these open discussions, but are maybe faced with people who aren't playing fairly, who, who don't want to live up to that original ethos of, of internet governance? Um, maybe I'll go back to you, Carl, just because it's been a while since we heard from you. Well, I mean, so far, I mean, good question, highly relevant question. So far, we've been rather successful. I mean, you, you, you referred to, uh, in the beginning of the discussion, to what we call the multi-stakeholder approach when it comes to governing the internet. That's been under sustained attack, uh, but we've been able to face off those attacks. And that particular model is still the model that applies. I mean, there are proposals in the ITU, from the Chinese side primarily, supported by the Russians and others, that would go for a completely state-controlled internet. And, and, and it's very important that we mobilize not only the Atlantic world, but also countries like India and others who have an interest in the as much as possible open governing space of the internet. That's also important because that is the dynamic space. I mean, this is still, this is still a very innovative industry. Things are moving all the time. Standards are changing. And to have that open framework of the multi-stakeholder approach is very important. But um, there's a need for closer dialogue across the Atlantic, across these issues. I mean, they've not been very much on the, on the radar screen of Brussels in the last few years. Uh, that's been more the regulatory approach that's been dominating Brussels. But we need to look at these other approaches as well. And, and that Brussels needs to step up, uh, step up the game. Uh, they were fairly absent, the Trump agenda as well, has to be said. Mm -hmm. um, Annette, we've seen proposals for a transatlantic trade and tech council. Uh, is that the sort of forum that Google would be supporting? Um, how, how, how should we actually conduct these discussions? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, we have been from from when the Commission proposed the tech, uh, Trade and Technology Council being very supportive of this forum. Um, we understand it will be announced or launched. Uh, we hope uh, in the in mid June uh, when the US and EU are having their summit. Um, we do believe it's an absolutely crucial form to indeed cooperate, discuss on uh, all the technology issues, uh, and but in particular AI, as Kai just mentioned, um, we uh, also believe it's important to um, discuss privacy, uh, DMA. Uh, we would uh, want the US to lean in to discuss the privacy laws before they actually adopt in the US. We would love the European Union to also vet and discuss the DMA before they actually adopt the DMA. So we do believe this Trade and Technology Council can be an absolute crucial vehicle to 
discuss and align on um, on future proof regulation, as I already mentioned, and to set standards for global regulation. Um, Alina, I'm thinking of a live example now where we saw the EU uh, in one way rush in, but it was a very long process. They, they rushed to make sure they had signed uh, an investment agreement with China just before the Biden administration came in, knowing the Biden administration wouldn't be very happy with that idea. Um, if we had something like a Trade and Technology Council operating transatlantically, um, could that have sort of saved us a bit of hassle over the last few months with something like the Chinese investment agreement? Because I'm imagining that players at that council would have raised a few red flags and said, hang on, like, why are you rushing? Surely it makes sense to work through this a bit more first. Uh, I, I would think so. I mean, it's hard to uh, know um, a hypothetical uh, and what the, the, what the outcome could have been. But I think certainly if we had had a forum for bilateral discussions between the United States and Europe, uh, particularly the EU, who's been leading on the pro effort, who's been leading on the the China investment agreement, which is now uh, a bit on ice, obviously, because now that we have a more engaged U.S. administration that is very keen to rebuild our alliances, to reinvest in our alliances, particularly with Europe, there are many more opportunities to avoid this kind of lack of coordination that we saw uh, with the China investment agreement, for example. And again, I think the top priority, of course, has to be what we're talking about today, because so much of both of our economies, European economy as well as the US economy, is being driven by digital trade. And we, over the years, because there was such a shortage of forum and cooperation on these issues, have seen quite significant barriers emerge, um, uh, some of the result of legal decisions with unintended consequences. For example, uh, we had a, a decision some, some time ago that basically invalidated uh, the agreement between the United States and Europe to be able to share data. This is uh, the Schrems II uh, le uh, legal uh, call that was made by a European court. And now we're finding ourselves this, in this problematic situation where we are putting at risk huge amounts of money, huge potentially huge amounts of jobs, and of course our ability to work together. And so Annette mentioned the Technology Trade Council, which was uh, something that, and this is not a new idea, it's been out there for some time, mm -hmm. but now it's becoming reinvigorated again, both by Europe and the United States. But I think the key here is to also understand that, yes, we will want to come together as a community of like-minded democracies, to band together, as you said, uh, to agree on a set of common guidelines and regulations that prioritize democratic values and principles and prioritize our ability to innovate and be leaders in the innovation space. But I think first and foremost, we have to get the US and Europe aligned. Why? Because the US still leads when it comes to technology, research, development, innovation, and Europe is increasingly leading on the regulatory front. You can't have one without the other. So I think the Technology and Trade Council is a very useful forum where we'll need to discuss very complex and uh, dry issues like digital tax, like AI issues, data sharing, all of these kinds of things. But at the end of the day, if Europe and the United States can come together on a consensus and cooperative set of understandings and then take it to say the G7, for example, uh, would be a potentially useful forum, but we have to have the bilateral alignment first and foremost. And I do think that's happening. Uh, I do think we'll see some good news uh, on that cooperation front and the forum front um, in mid-June uh, during the summit. Uh, but I think we have to get down, roll up our sleeves and go beyond just saying, yes, we want to work together and actually solve some of the real problems uh, that we currently have from emerging from years of lack of cooperation on these issues. Mm -hmm. um, Ava, um, I love your reactions to, to the other panelists, but also I thought maybe I'll ask you a specific question given your political philosophy as a, a social democrat. We've seen the Biden administration really put a big focus on having a foreign policy that works for the middle class. Uh, I was helping out at the Copenhagen Democracy Summit earlier in the week, and they had a new report out which says that the biggest threat to democracy um, is this really entrenched economic inequality. And then obviously we've also seen a situation where um, 
because of the nature of the pandemic and because of the very clever business models of digital companies, they've been doing better than ever. Um, so reactions to the previous panelists and also what role can these hugely successful tech companies play in dealing with those inequality issues, you know, treating those inequality issues as one aspect of democracy that we also need to be thinking about. Well, I think we would all agree that uh, under the pandemic, the inequalities actually increased for the companies that were using um, these technologies and they were more advanced and more digital. They were, they, they were the most resilient ones. So um, I have the feeling that we, uh, we all agree that we need a new regulatory framework and this is why uh, we have so much regulation in uh, the European Union because, as I said, the, um, our approach is a bit more um, pro-tech regulation than the US. Um, and, and we uh, aim to be a world tech regulator and the US wants to let loose its uh, industrial firepower. I believe we have to have both in a balance uh, in order to achieve uh, the maximum. In, in US, we have states that moved very fast to restrict technologies of facial recognition and um, using biometrics in public spaces, for example. Uh, while in, in Europe, the, the bills they have, I mean, it's, it's similar to the European approach where we want to ban the use of remote biometric surveillance uh, by law enforcement uh, in public places, unless it's necessary in, uh, I think it's in three different cases um, for, for serious crimes, uh, for children missing, for a terrorist attack. And of course, it has to be prior, uh, it has, there has to be a prior legal authorization from the police in order to use these biometrics. So um, I have the feeling that uh, we need to be on the same table and start a dialogue. And I have the feeling also with this new administration, we will achieve that because we are risking to have more and more inequalities with these technologies. Uh, we have different speeds and we, we, we need, as you saw in Europe, to have the prism of digital and the green to become um, the prism for everything that goes through our budget in order to become more resilient in, in uh, the next challenge that we might face, that faces no borders in the end. Um, so I have the feeling that Europe has a vision that could actually lead this discussion globally. Um, and uh, I'm not biased, I think. I have the feeling that uh, for the first time, we have the foresight to prepare and to avoid uh, using these technologies to um, exclude citizens for social ranking that we see in China, um, for um, uh, for creating um, a very strong environment where the tech decides, the tech companies decide to self-regulate, and the state is just uh, following and, of course, has a very strong power to um, to respond if they see any any breach of of, of the law. Um, but I do believe that we need to translate our existing rules into the online regulation uh, because it hasn't been uh, synchronized it hasn't been modernized the last 20 years so we definitely need to do so and um and and yes i am biased as for that the new administration of us can definitely move into the same into this direction and can be more ambitious um you you saw what happened with oecd and the g20 they have already agreed to specific standards we have created a partnership so um i i was uh, in a discussion with oecd three three four months ago we agreed at the level of the parliamentary uh, parliamentarian networks we have oecd and the european parliament to set um our uh, framework of what ai should uh, should be and we have um, participants from like several countries, not just European, but beyond. So I think if this is what politicians uh, believe we should do to avoid having people's perceptions manipulated, our democracy is threatened by this technology, and in the end, try to have the benefits of what we can achieve if there is legal certainty and if we can collaborate, uh, then uh, we can be optimistic. Can I give you an example? Do you know ECDC, the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control? It's the, mm -hmm. the European agency that had access to all the health data when the pandemic started. Basically, I would say they gathered 80% of all the data around the virus and how it was uh, uh, expanding and how it was uh, uh, treated in its hospital, in its member state. What was the main problem? was that this data, they were all collected in such different standards and ways and languages and systems that in the end, they were so difficult to use that we lost 
a lot of time until our doctors realized what is the best practice to use and learn from each other. So if we manage to have common standards, this could actually save lives. So um, I think that uh, we will all agree to that. And it's just a matter of keeping the, the dialogue open and trying to see um, the, the minimum um, standard that we can agree on. Um, maybe we have some differences, but at least we will know that we have uh, a level of protections for citizens and our quality of life. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, Annette, I should give you a chance to respond. I, I, I think I was hinting really at things like digital tax in that previous question, where mm -hmm. we're seeing more, uh, we, there is a global process. We've seen the US administration say there should be a, a global corporate minimum tax rate. Um, where do you guys see the the balance between uh, what government's role is in, in making sure there are decent social outcomes and, and something that looks like equality in democracies? Um, and and, and what's, what's your contribution as a, as a large company there? Sure. And, and let me let me just uh, clarify a couple of points. I think on on AI, we do believe it's a technology that it's too important to not be regulated, and we have invested a lot of uh, we, we we are engaging in uh, finding a good framework and are really uh, keen to get this right uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. And indeed, uh, to to come back to the TTC, it's important that's on 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 its agenda. Uh, we are also leaning in on reforming the e-commerce directive um, and finding a new uh, framework uh, that is regulating tech. Uh, we here we engage. I think that's that's very clear to us. Uh, the same on DMA. On uh, on the digital tax, uh, yes, well, you know our very thin line here, and this is. We do believe we need a global solution, um, the OECD process. Again, we are leaning into finding or contributing to this discussion. And this is where we are. We are not against regulation at all. Uh, we just do believe we need to find the right balance um, to, yes, regulate, but also to not uh, in, uh, prevent innovation from happening and economic growth in particular. On on the inequality uh, topic, well, I could I could speak at length about our contribution to that point. Uh, we are obviously uh, uh, committed to digital skills uh, um, in in Europe and around the world. Uh, we have just yesterday launched a new Google.org fund uh, on uh, addressing disabilities and uh, digital skills. Uh, we do so and lean in on on the in particular on the topic of of, of uh, digital skills and do find we are playing an important role in in um, in enabling individuals, businesses, but also governments in 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 uh, embracing digital skills more broadly. Uh, I could go on and on with the investments we have made uh, last year in the past years on the specific topic. I guess uh, we, when I uh, recollect correctly, we also announced last year at the Delphi Forum how much we invest in, in the topic of digital skills. So I don't want to advertise uh, too, too broadly what the company is doing, but you all know Google is, is really invested in the topic and we, we totally understand our role. Uh, in 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 the social uh, to 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 um, to balance our social inequalities through digital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we've got a, around about four or five minutes left, so I think it's time to sort of invite everyone to give a minute of final thoughts. Um, make it whatever you will, um, but I guess my framing prompt is, um, you know, if you've got one or two priorities about where you want to see democracies organizing themselves over the next year when it comes to technology. Um, tell us what those priorities are and, and, and who you want to, to act or join you in delivering that priority. Um, Carl, I'll turn to you. Well, very briefly, go back a couple of years in time and we tried to organize what was called TTIP over the Atlantic. That was of a trade issue that failed because of the chlorinated chicken and Trump. Uh, and uh, that's history. Now it's a digital space that uh, is the most important. And we need to sort of have a digital alliance across the Atlantic. That's going to be difficult because emphasis is very different in the US and in Europe. And my main concern, as a matter of fact, is Europe uh, being so obsessed with regulation that we are falling behind. Just take one concrete example. Uh, 
uh, 5G rollout, which is going to be absolutely critical to everything else. China is ahead. The U.S. is second. Europe, that has world-leading companies because of regulation and fragmented market, are four or five years behind in one of the key technologies for the future. And we can regulate ourselves to the bottom, but we can't regulate ourselves to the top. Very fair point. Uh, Alina. Well, this is this is a, a more of a long term uh, goal, but we can start in, in small ways to get there. I think with some of the uh, ideas we've been discussing in this panel, uh, I think the long term goal has to be to understand that this is what we're talking about here is not just about specific technology. It's not just about five G, uh, which has been a big debate. Obviously, it's not just about personal data and data sharing. Uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We're in a really critical moment in the development of new technologies that are completely transforming our societies, they're trans our relationships to each other, they're transforming how we engage in conflict and combat, military and defense technologies. We haven't touched on that. But even here, we're having massive divergences now between NATO countries in, within our own alliance. And of course, we need to get our act together so we can ensure that we can have interoperability um, even across the defense technology sector as well. And so my point is to say, we're at this sort of pre-Cambrian moment. You know, this is an evolutionary moment, if I can use that metaphor, where simple life forms combined and then led to complex life and many thousands of years ago. And I think this is where we are right now in technology, where we're seeing developments in AI, we're seeing developments elsewhere, but very, very soon we're going to be overtaken you know, when these technologies start to combine. And if we don't lay the groundwork now in these small ways that we've been talking about, set up the forum, focus on low hanging fruit, like data sharing, we're not going to be able to get ahead of this going forward. Thanks, Alina. We've got one minute left. So maybe 30 seconds each, uh, Ava, and then final word to you, Annette. Well, I, I will find the opportunity to say that in the end, I think democracies will win. And I don't think that regulation means fragmentation if it's smart regulation. So um, uh, if you had to choose where you want to live, I think you would choose Europe in any case. So I don't think we're losing this fight. I think uh, supporting to protect fundamental rights is really what gives us this quality of life here. Um, in the end, of course, there are new business models that we have to allow to flourish and to um, to give them space to, to grow. Uh, but I, I think you will see that the new agenda is focusing a lot into talent maintaining uh, in Europe, to skills, and also to give control and options to citizens. And I don't feel that this could go wrong in the end, at least. Maybe we delay, but I think in the end, uh, the company and the illegal environment uh, to use all these applications once they have the legal certainty that we agree on the common standards. And the final word to you, Annette. Thanks. I have said it. I w wish really we would pivot from digital autonomy to digital uh, and strategic interdependence and get rid of the digital sovereignty obsession in Europe and really lean into strategic interdependence. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank you all for joining this panel. It was brief, but beautiful. And now it's time for the next session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you.